Good afternoon and welcome to today's local government education program provided by the University of Illinois Extension. My name is Stephen Groner. I'm a community and economic development educator. For sound quality, we will mute the microphones during the presentation. If you have any problems with sound or connections, add comments to the chat space where we will be monitoring things. I will also watch the chat space for comments and questions to pose to our speakers at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and is titled Illinois State Legislative Update. It is presented by Kelly Murray and Taylor Anderson, Illinois Association of County Board Members. Kelly Murray has served as Executive Director for the Illinois Association of County Board Members since 1997 and has over two decades of experience in local government relations, having served also as Executive Director for the Illinois Association of Regional Councils, founder of the counties of Illinois Risk Management Agency, CIRMA, and Legislative Consultant for the Taxpayers Federation of Illinois. Kelly administered the Illinois Energy Now Public Sector Program in partnership with the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, Ameren, Illinois, ComEd, and NICOR, providing incentives and rebates to local governments for completion of energy efficiency projects. She also administered the federal ARRA Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program through DCEO, which allocated over $11 million in funding to 273 county projects throughout Illinois, serving as a national model for state-led approaches to grant administration and delivery through local regional councils. Taylor Anderson is a full-time registered contractual lobbyist in the state of Illinois, has spent nearly a decade working with the Illinois General Assembly. He has lobbied on behalf of wide and diverse groups of clients including various COGs and local governments, as well as numerous business entities and corporations. His legislative experience spans several state agencies, including Secretary of State Jesse White's office, the Illinois Senate President Emil Jones Revenue Committee, Illinois Environmental Protection Agency Legislative Affairs Division, the Illinois Chamber of Commerce Government Affairs Division, and in the Legislative Office of the Governor. He also worked closely with top state agency heads and members of the Illinois Senate. Since 2008, Taylor has traveled across the state speaking on the impact of various legislation and legislative issues, specifically legislation affecting Illinois counties. A recording of this webinar will be made available on our local government education website and YouTube channel. Participants will receive slides, links to the resources, and a recording for today's webinar. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Kelly and Taylor. Oh, thank you, Stephen. And welcome everyone to our annual legislative webinar. I know you're extremely busy as county officials and department heads, so I truly appreciate your participation today. We've been conducting this webinar for well over a decade now, and I wanna personally thank the University of Illinois Extension for hosting this webinar series. Um, they do other great educational content with these webinars throughout the year, so I strongly encourage you to tap into future ones um, as your schedule allows. Our presentation today will primarily focus on the new laws for 2020 that may impact local governments. However, we will conclude with some comments on pending legislation as part of our ongoing policy agenda for county governments. Um, as you know, last January, Governor Pritzker was inaugurated, and then along with that came a gain of seats for the Democratic Party in both the House and Senate. So as a result of majorities held in both of those chambers, most of the governor's policy goals were enacted. But it also came with some bipartisan support. In particular, we had a, you know, the new state budget as well as a capital construction program. Other key measures that were included with the minimum wage increase, the gaming expansion, uh, obviously the legalization uh, of recreational cannabis, and we had the approval of the graduated income tax amendment that will go before the voters on the November 2020 ballot. So those are some of the bigger ticket items that we, uh, we were monitoring uh, this past year and, and were also part of the governor's policy goals. Over 600 bills were enacted into law uh, this last year. 
which is not unusual. Illinois General Assembly, as you know, runs on a two-year cycle. So this being the second year we're getting into now with 2020, we're kind of anticipating about a 50% drop in bill introductions. Usually we see about 6,000 the first year and then we'll see around 3,000 the second year. So we have a new Senate president just recently and Senator Don Harmon of Oak Park uh, out of Cook County. So there will be some relationship building taking place probably this spring as a result and hopefully some continued bipartisan cooperation on, on some of these issues that the county governments and local governments are interested in. We, we're hoping for um, some progress moving forward. Also being an election year uh, this year, it's not unusual for some of the more controversial measures to kind of take a back seat. We're gonna see some primary advancements of the more significant bills taking place probably in the last month is when we see the most action. So, um, you know, the schedule to German is May 31st. So usually around May 1st, we start, start seeing the, the bill movements coming a little quicker. And you've also got some deadlines in May that both chambers have to adhere to. So, so overall, um, the session days are a little fewer this year and then spring break is just slightly longer, nothing out of the usual. Um, so the second year session, a lot of time focused primarily on budget issues too. So we're gonna be dealing with a lot of that this year. I'll, um, I'll look, join you back later on the program um, to talk a little bit about some of the resources we have available for you throughout the year on the legislation and how we track it and what's available on our website. And uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Taylor, and he'll get us started on the, the, new, the new laws review. Taylor. Thanks, Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's call. Um, I asked you to bear with me. I'm, I'm in control of the, <laughs> the PowerPoint. I'm a bit of a Luddite, so um, <laughs> barring any glitches, we'll, we'll be mindful of everyone's time and try to move through uh, the bills in, uh, in a timely fashion. As Kelly said, we're going to focus on um, key pieces of legislation that were passed during the 2019 year um, that are now in effect. <clears throat> we'll spend a little bit of time at the end just uh, talking about some issues we think might be reoccurring in this upcoming uh, General Assembly, which does not begin until next Tuesday. Um, so we have not started session yet for, for 2020. Um, with that said, we'll, we'll go ahead and jump in uh, to the bill. The first bill <clears throat> we'll talk about is Senate Bill uh, 75. And this was part of uh, a, obviously a, a, a national dialogue dealing with um, sexual harassment and um, making changes in the workplace. Uh, this was a bill that was really um, took many months to get all of the stakeholders involved and get this language uh, messed out. And there's more bills. Uh, we think there's gonna be more tweaks to this. There was certainly a tweak we'll talk about next during veto session, uh, and there's likely to be more as well. But this really um, strengthens the ability for employees to report uh, allegations of sexual harassment um, at all levels of, of, of the government and really kind of protects um, those that had felt um, there was something improper done in a workplace setting. <clears throat> you know, I think it's important that um, everyone at your local level review what they currently have on the books, current practices that they have to make sure that your departments are up to speed with the new laws and rules and regulations that, that are in, in effect. Um, we want to make sure that if there, if an employee does feel um, or makes a complaint uh, of a charge of allegation of sexual harassment, that proper procedures are in place, that those procedures have been followed, and um, <coughs> that that employee is protected um, as they exercise exercise their rights. So uh, again, this is this is going to be very important moving forward. We hope there's been enough time for, for most everyone to have updated um, the rules and regulations regarding this. But um, as I said, we, we are anticipating there to be some more tweaks along the way um, as this new law kind of settles in. I think what's really important, the next bill we want to talk about 
is the or the next component we want to talk about that which is the sexual harassment training um, and this is going to be um, very key moving forward because this requires an annual training uh, for sexual harassment that all employees must undergo um, Kelly I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about uh, the tools that are being made available by the state for uh, the sexual harassment training Yes, we've been getting a lot of questions on this bill and, and it's um, in reason because again, this is a big undertaking as Taylor mentioned. The sexual has harassment training um, that is put in place with requirements on this bill um, is for all employees. So if you think about that, even businesses, there's no caps on the number of employees. Um, so everyone will need to be taking annual training. With respect to the local governments, um, the state is required through this piece of legislation to develop the program for the training. So we anticipate that they are going to be doing the online training similar to what we've had to do in past years as lobbyists uh, during our registration. So we did talk to the state earlier this week and they are moving forward on getting this system developed. So with counties uh, right now in our local governments, just understand uh, the compliance is within a year so you still have some time. I don't want you to panic and think you have to start training employees tomorrow. The other thing is, you know, um, we have mechanisms. We've done training and sexual harassment through our insurance and other things for our counties. But it doesn't make sense to, we feel, to be doing on-site training. There's no way for you guys to actually go out and, and get all your employees in a room together in a day and train them. And if you have new hires, to have that continuous You'll also have to have a record that they've completed the training. So the online system, um, obviously, that the state's probably going to develop is going to be the primary mechanism for use by local governments. However, you can use something that's equivalent or superior to the training program. We are aware of some of those, and, and we may put something in place um, to kind of get counties working in that manner if necessary. But uh, I would say to be patient, hopefully we'll see the development of the program coming from the state and then it will be made accessible. Again, this will be required on an annual basis. So with your turnover in employees, uh, you know, face-to-face -face training is not really gonna be something that's, that's going to work in this, in, with respect to the new law. So um, if you have any questions about it, please give me a call after this, uh, this uh, meeting today and we'll be happy to help uh, direct you a little bit and how to get moving forward on this. As Taylor yeah. mentioned, we did want to make sure you update your, your workplace policies. And we did provide a sample policy earlier this year to our counties. If you are a member and you didn't receive that, then you get a hold of me afterwards and we'll get that sent to you. Okay, Taylor, thank you. Yeah, and, and I think Kelly brings up a very good point. Um, this is going to be required annually. And as you have new hires come in, um, you know, if, if you have, um, you know, seasonal employees come in, they're going to have to undergo this training as well. So it's not like you can just every January, you know, have one training and, and get everyone um, in compliance. You're going to have to modify and manage uh, when new employees come in uh, and when they're able to, to take this training. So I, I think there's going to need to be probably some reconfiguring done um, about what that hiring process entails. Um, Certainly the fact that the state's going to be providing a free model, hopefully um, once they get that done, sh should make things a little easier, especially for local government. Right. Um, as, and as Taylor said, too, I mean, for record keeping purposes, you're going to need this. So once those, um, you know, employees take the training and they get receipt that they have taken the training, you'll want to keep that in your employee files. Because again, for loss control measures or anything like that, you want to make sure that you have receipt that they've taken the training. If you're absolutely if you're doing something face to face, it's going to be your word, and that's not going to suffice in the long run if any accusations are made. So again, this is the way it's going to have to go. You're going to have to have the online likely and to have a receipt of completion by each employee on an annual basis, and you want Correct. to put that in your employee files. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and that record keeping, again, is going to be essential because um, if you note at the bottom, employers um, are going to be subject to civil penalties under this new provision um, to 
up to 500 to 5,000. Um, so it's going to be key and, and, and you're going to want to make sure that you have uh, records and receipts of, you know, that employee receiving um, this training so that, so that you are qualified and, and fine under, under the new law. So again, I, I think it, it's going to be, um, there's going to need to be some change in, in how things are done at the local level, how your hiring process moves. Um, but it's changed that, you know, it's law now, it has to be done. Um, I think being conscientious of when new hires are going to be taken up, uh, um, coming in uh, and making sure that you keep records of them is, is going to be very important moving forward. We'll move to the next bill, which was Senate Bill 119. <clears throat> and this was a big change um, in Illinois law and really the, the national conversation that had been happening for a while with the presence of uh, the growing presence of online retailers um, versus the you know traditional brick and mortar shops, the disparity that uh, had been kind of taking place with regards to sales tax at the local level, but also for the state. Um, there was a Supreme Court case. Um, the Wayfair decision came down, and so that allowed for now uh, new laws to be crafted in compliance um, with the decision at the Supreme Court uh, or the guideline that came out of the decision at the Supreme Court level. So uh, Senate Bill 119 was uh, put forward by the Illinois Retail Merchants Association. Uh, they reached out to our association and, and, we, and walked us through some of the components of this. Um, this is going to um, really change how sales tax online um, is now being being collected. So that now moving forward where the purchase is made, that's where the sales tax will be going. Uh, so we're going to be <clears throat> um, at, at, be collecting taxes at the at the point of destination on sales. Um, through the online marketplace and remote retailers. And so again, that's going to be a big change. Um, I think the only retails merchants, when they looked at um, the available data uh, for previous years, they're, they're making some projections that um, this fix to Illinois law could result in, you know, somewhere um, between 400 and 460 million um, new dollars. Uh, for FY21. Uh, so, you know, those are dollars that had been going elsewhere that now we won't be capturing locally uh, because of because of this change in, in this fix. Um, there's not going to be situations where, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, you're, you're going to be able to skirt sales tax um, at the local level or at the state level by purchasing products online. So, again, this is a this is a, a, a pretty massive change um, considering the, the numbers of dollars we're talking about coming to the state level and to the local uh, level. Um, obviously, the Department of Revenue will be responsible for um, collecting and then remitting those sales tax dollars down to the local level. Uh, but certainly, we think this not only brings some parity to the process um, for uh, traditional brick and mortar um, shops that obviously have. Uh, you know, the local sales tax and the state sales tax uh, are already in place. But now um, if you make an online purchase in that same jurisdiction, um, there's going to be parity between those, those two taxes. And so um, we're looking forward to this being fully implemented and having a full year uh, to, to see if the estimates um, that were projected uh, mesh up. Uh, obviously, this sector just continues to grow. Um, more and more transactions and sales are being made online. And so we, we think that, um, you know, this fix should, should help um, make whole some of the losses that we were seeing at the local level. We'll move to the next bill, which was uh, Senate Bill 556. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, again, you know, the last two bills, um, you know, we're talking about national trends and how they have manifested themselves into law in, in Illinois. And this, um, I think, is a, a 
or I should say national conversations. I think this is a continuation of that. Um, this requires every single occupancy bathroom in a public building to be labeled gender neutral. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this applies to all public places. Um, and there's going to need to be uh, signage that marks that single occupancy rest restroom um, as gender neutral. And, you know, whatever type of sign um, sign that you decide to go with, um, that sign, it just needs to not indicate any specific uh, gender. So this is something that's gonna, gonna need to uh, happen and take place. Health officers and health inspectors will be allowed to inspect public buildings during any inspection to ensure compliance. And so, um, you know, again, this is just something that is now law and now needs to happen. Again, this only applies to single occupancy re restrooms. Um, so if you have a single occupancy restroom that are right, if you have two that are right ne next to one another uh, and traditionally one had been labeled uh, male and one had been labeled female, they both now, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they both now would need to be uh, labeled as uh, either all gender or, or not indicate a specific gender. So again, um, that is now law and it's something we need to comply with. Um, the next two bills are, um, you know, kind of more Illinois focused. Um, Senate Bill 1236, <clears throat> excuse me, was a large, larger omnibus Bill, it did, uh, made a bunch of changes to um, the county's codes, uh, but one of the, probably the major change that it did was it will now prohibit elected officials who are receiving an IMRF pension based on services uh, in a previous position from receiving a salary for that same position um, in the future. So what we're talking about here is if we had a, a a county board member <clears throat> who served for a number of years, was vested, uh, decided not to run or lost, um, was no longer serving in that capacity, um, decided to draw from their IMRF pension, and then later down the line um, decided to run or was appointed to uh, that same position as a county board member, they would not be um, eligible to receive a salary uh, based on this. This issue was uh, really came out of a of a local issue um, in the Collar counties um, where some folks had had been having this uh, issue, and so it um, it moved itself from kind of a local issue to now it's it's statewide law. Um, there's a lot of conversation on this. Uh, there's a lot of pushback, um, you know, particularly from our group on this. Um, you know, there's there's not really any secrets, um, in, in my opinion, if, if someone is a, is a pensioner and is reelected, the voters know that, but, but now this is, is law. Uh, I think the key point here is same position. So if you had someone um, who was a county board member and then decided to run for sheriff, that's not the same position. Um, and, and other examples, obviously, we can, we can all think of, but the same position, if you are receiving uh, a pension you and are reelected to that position, uh, you will not be eligible to receive a salary. So um, particularly for smaller counties, we know this is this is going to have an impact. Um, you know, sometimes people retire and go do other things uh, and decide to get back into public service, which, um, you know, I, I do worry that this might negatively impact um, folks deciding to return uh, to public service because I, I don't think, I don't think many people get into uh, to local politics to, to get rich, but uh, those are just my opinions. And, and we do have Senate bill 1236 as law now. The next bill is Senate bill 1699. Um, this bill, <clears throat> excuse me, prohibits um, with a few exemptions, but prohibits a law enforcement agency from publishing booking photographs, um, also known as mugshots, on their 
on its social networking website. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I do know there's a couple of jurisdictions or several jurisdictions throughout the state um, that previously were doing this. Um, you know, they would either have a, a Facebook page or, um, you know, a, the sheriff's department would have a Twitter account. Um, that will no longer be allowed. You will not be allowed to publish those photographs. Um, I believe descriptions um, are still fine, uh, descriptions of crimes, et cetera, but photographs um, from mugshots will no longer be allowed on social networking websites. So, you know, we're talking Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, the like. The definition, <clears throat> excuse me, for this, uh, the actual social networking website was taken from um, another section of law, and it is important that that be referenced. It, it comes from, um, excuse me, it, it, it comes from the, um, just lost it. Uh, the Right to Privacy in the Workplace Act. And so um, those two laws now share a common description. So if, if there's any question about whether or not uh, a website you are, are using or utilizing or, or how you display uh, those pictures, <clears throat> uh, you're, you'll need to check with either your state's attorney or general counsel just to make sure that um, you're not violating um, this new law. Right, and, and Taylor, I might add, um, this is one small piece of what we might see forthcoming in other areas as local governments start um, getting online with respect to Facebook, Twitter, other accounts, which many of our various departments have, in particular the Sheriff's Department. It might be wise, and we've been looking into this for some of our counties <clears throat> with respect to developing some in-house policies on the regula regulation of how your department or your elected officials use those social media networks because um, you know this is one little piece that's coming out with rights to privacy. We could be seeing more of this. And the last thing you want to do is put yourself in a in a position uh, with respect to um, you know a lawsuit or something. So it may be wise in the future as you guys move forward with social media. We know that it was very quick and it, and it came to a lot of departments and a lot of things get posted. But you might wanna start looking at an in-house policy on how those pages or those um, social media networks are used by your own elected officials. We have to make sure as well with personal information and anything else that we're not out there doing something with respect that could create a, um, a liability problem for the counties. Correct. We'll move on to <clears throat> uh, two more bills um, dealing more with financial issues. Uh, the first is Senate Bill 1712. Um, you know, Kelly and I talk a lot about this when the FOIA um, the Freedom of Information Act was kind of really redone and, and set into place, I think back in 2010, Kelly, if I remember correctly. Yes. Uh, it was done with much haste and um, not a lot of input from some of the local uh, public bodies, which, you know, has caused, uh, I think, Kelly and I just undue amount of headaches. Um, they left out a lot of things. And, and this was one that thankfully they were able to go back and, and explicitly make sure it was exempt. But, um, you know, when you rush through things, sometimes these are um, the type of issues that can fall through the cracks. And so this just makes sure that uh, a public body's credit card numbers, their debit card numbers, their bank account numbers, their federal employee identification numbers, security code numbers, passwords, and all other account information is exempt 
from FOIA. Um, I don't think anyone had in mind when FOIA was passed that it would be a good idea for uh, any person to be able to go out and get bank account numbers and credit card numbers of a public body. Um, you know, this, this exempts that, um, you know, obviously there's a caveat, it's a disclosure of which could result in identity theft or uh, impersonation or defrauding of a government entity. I think we can all agree that any of these uh, types of information um, would all lead to that. And so it, it was, it's good that moving forward, um, now that this will be explicitly exempt, there was, there was some thought that it was already kind of uh, exempt, but um, there was some befuddlement, I guess, and, and potential for a, a court case. And so now it's explicitly exempt um, that public bodies don't have to disclose those types of information. Um, Senate Bill 1806 uh, was a trailer bill to um, kind of just clean up some language in the Municipal Audit Act, the County Audit Act, and the Governmental Audit Act. Uh, if you remember last year, um, <clears throat> we talked about some changes that the Comptroller's Office um, was making with regards to uh, how units of local government um, submit their auditing uh, or have their auditing done and then submit that to Illinois Comptroller's Office, whether they use the accrual or the cash base method for accounting. Um, we were able to work on that and, and get that issue resolved, grandfathering in units of local government who currently are then use cash base uh, moving forward as long as they continue to use the cash base accounting, um, they don't have to do anything different. Uh, this trailer bill just updated some specific sites um, within the act that reflect, you know, generally accepted uh, auditing standards. This was put forward, um, you know, by the CPA Society um, just to true up some of the language used in, um, you know, the new law with uh, some of the language that they actually use uh, day to day. And so we were happy to work with them on this and happy this bill um, was signed the law and hopefully we can lay this issue uh, to rest. Um, the next bill is Senate Bill 1932, and this created the Property Tax Relief Task Force. Um, <clears throat> as part of this bill, there is a task force um, put together, created um, by the governor's office, and they were to look at property taxes in the state of Illinois and the property tax uh, situation. Um, Several weeks ago, there was a bunch of news articles throughout the state um, regarding this. Uh, I'll just back up real quick. They began meeting, I believe, in August. Uh, at that time, there was 88 members of the General Assembly who decided uh, that they'd like to participate on this task force. That's almost half of the members in the General Assembly. Um, that task force was broken into, uh, I believe, seven different subcommittees. Uh, to look at various uh, specific um, areas of property tax, such as, um, you know, PTAIL, uh, school funding, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a final report, according to this law, was supposed to be submitted to the governor and the General Assembly by December 31st. Uh, that deadline has come and gone. A final lies report has not been released yet. Um, we are anticipating at some point there to be a finalized report. Um, latest um, information regarding this, we might pass that the deadline or the, that date at the note at the bottom um, because session will begin on January 28th. And at this point in time, I don't believe um, the report has been finalized. Ba the back and forth in the newspaper um, was kind of broken down on a uh, a partisan basis, the Democrats had put together a draft report um, that the Republicans said that they had no input in. Uh, the Democrats responded that the draft report was sent to the Republicans so that they could make edits and changes to that. Um, 
However, they didn't do that, and so that's why they missed the deadline. So this back and forth um, will continue. Um, I, I think, uh, as Kelly mentioned earlier, obviously this is an election year, and I believe property taxes are going to be uh, a, a key politically as we move, you know, past through primaries and, and start get focusing on the general election. And so this has now not just become a policy issue, uh, this has become a political issue. Um, and so our anticipation is that uh, we probably won't receive a, a full result, um, maybe at the end of the session, um, but it, it, it could be likely that we see uh, two reports one from the Democrats and one from the Republicans. Um, <clears throat> again, once this issue kind of leaves the policy realm and gets into the political realm, um, kind of all bets are off with regards to what a finalized report will be. We do know that, um, you know, we did see a draft report that was leaked. Um, the draft report spent a lot of time detailing uh, the complexity of property taxes in the state of Illinois, which, you know, I think was good. Uh, it, it, it really did a, a pretty good job of breaking down how property taxes work. That's one thing that I've noted uh, General Assembly members don't often fully understand how property taxes work at the local level. Um, and so we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to, to wait for a finalized report. In the meantime, we do anticipate there to be several bills um, taking aim at um, creating some type of property tax relief. Uh, whether that is, you know, a property tax freeze or, or some other types of mechanisms, um, we do anticipate there to be a lot of legislation directed at property taxes. Uh, some of those bills might actually contain things that will result in property tax relief. Uh, some of them, like a property tax freeze, um, might not do much more than pay lip service to the idea of property tax relief. And so, again, this is going to be an issue um, that's going to get a lot of attention we're anticipating this session. Right. And as Taylor uh, mentioned, the testimony that took place last fall, um, you know, we were involved in some of those hearings. I think one of the things that, that well, a major concern that we have as an organization and for our counties um, was, you know, support somewhat coming in, testimony for the idea of statewide tax caps. Um, you know, to to uh, to put PTEL in all the counties, and that's a big concern to us because we also know that those counties currently dealing with that have some difficulty. So again, we're going to be monitoring this very closely to see what comes out. Now, again, some of that was primarily coming from the collar counties where you know those those taxes are higher. But again, if they were to implement something statewide with respect to the, uh, you know, the property tax extension limitation law, that would have a strong impact on all of our members and could be very devastating. So, again, we want to keep you abreast of this. So um, we'll be alerting you um, if the if the report comes out or we see any new pieces of legislation, any different from past years. Those pieces of legislation to do that have been introduced before. But we will um, be keeping a closer eye on it, obviously, um, if there looks like there might be a gain of support in the General Assembly to move something um, that drastic forward. Yeah, and, and Kelly's absolutely right. Um, I think one of the biggest frustrations for, you know, and I, I think, Kelly, I can speak on your behalf with this is, for Kelly and myself, is the fact that um, continuously the General Assembly looks at property taxes, uh, and they only look at the amount of revenue uh, being raised. They never actually look at the expenditures that a unit of local government must make. And a lot of those mandates come down from Springfield, um, and they're unfunded. The, the plethora of unfunded mandates um, that come out of the General Assembly each and every year and then there's a cry about why um, units of local government, you know, need so much money. Well, you're mandating that we provide these services or do these new things or, or have these new training programs, and you're not giving any money uh, to help perform those duties. 
And so to me, when I looked at the draft report, that was something that really was frustrating because there was no mention of unfunded mandates or the pressure from Springfield to do certain things and, and to operate in certain manners or to provide certain um, things. Um, instead, they only focused on um, the property tax issue. And so I, I don't think you can just focus on one without focusing on the other. Right. And as Taylor mentioned, you know, last in the, in the last administration, we had the lieutenant governor who took on the unfunded mandates, had a task force, we had a report. Taylor and I contributed to that report. We had a lot of suggestions on the unfunded mandates. We don't put a lot of <laughs> um, efforts with respect to the General Assembly following up a lot of times on these task forces and recommendations because we've seen them come and go and they sit on the shelf. So again, keep in mind, there was an effort uh, you know, in the prior administration to do just the same, look at the unfunded mandates, several identified, did they take action on any? No. So again, we're back to square one, looking at one side of the picture, uh, you know, and, and not looking at the, the, the whole thing. And, um, you know, those recommendations still stand, we'll stand by them. But uh, keep that in mind. It's, it's, you know, we're looking only at one area here. And if they don't take it as a whole, I'm not sure we're going to see much relief overall for uh, whether it be for the taxpayers or the local governments. A absolutely. Um, we'll move to the next bill, House Bill 245. Um, I'll be honest, when this bill was introduced, I had to look up what a, a mobile carrying device was. Uh, this is basically these uh, robotic luggage character uh, carriers. Um, and I'd never seen one in per uh, person until I uh, made a trip out west and um I, I happened to see one rolling down the street it was very interesting but essentially these are uh luggage on wheels that kind of just follow along um their owner and so there's a framework now there was no framework before um in illinois about how these have to be operated um they have to stay within 10 feet of their owners um they do have the owners operators excuse me have the same uh, obligations of pedestrians uh, you know as normally um, so you know you you can't just these things just can't be rolling around with by themselves um, they cannot be used to transport a person uh, which is good to note and I think what's really important about this is the new law gives local governments authority to enact their own regulations um, you know so Sometimes in certain areas, um, having these mobile carrying devices just may not make sense for the type of traffic that goes through a particular area, whether it's heavy car traffic, um, heavy congestions with pedestrians, uh, et cetera. So uh, this will give you know, to local government uh, an opportunity. I haven't seen, um, to create laws, I haven't seen too many of these um, in my travels around the state yet. Um, who knows if we'll see more. Uh, but again, there's a, Kelly included a picture on, on the PowerPoint. If, if you've never seen one, um, they are a bit surreal in person. I will just, I will say that from my own experience. Um, but we've got a legal framework now. Um, I think, you know, whether or not these become more widely utilized in the future or not is still up in the air. Um, at that time, we may need to come back and make some tweaks. But again, the fact that local governments have the ability to enact their own regulations, um, I think is, is, is a big positive moving forward. Um, House Bill 348 deals with local government consolidation. We talked a little bit about a very similar bill last year um, uh, that did not, was, excuse me, was not signed in the law. Uh, this bill was signed in law. Um, it has really two main sections. One section only applies really to Lake County and the uh, other section really only applies to McHenry County. We'll talk about the Lake County um, issue first just because <clears throat> it's a little easier. Uh, essentially, this, the, the, the secondary provision within this bill abolishes road districts of less than 15 miles of road in Lake County of which there was only four those uh, four road districts have now been absorbed uh, into the township. 
and most townships can enter into intergovernmental agreements to administer their road work, um, either with other townships or with a third party contractor, uh, if they so choose. Uh, the real meat of what this bill did was it created a petition initiated dissolution of any township in McHenry County. Um, I think from, you know, the association's perspective, uh, you know, we have been involved in uh, the consult, many of the, or all of the consolidation conversations that have happened over many years. Um, it seems like every year there's a new idea um, to, to handle or, or to go about doing consolidation. The one that um, kind of raised a red flag for us at the association, um, the one issue is that essentially the way that this bill is drafted, um, the petition initiated uh, process is all done within the township. The township. Um, the county has no ability to weigh in. And, and we, we think that kind of causes some concern because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, for one, the county, when that township is dissolved, the county has to absorb all their duties, responsibilities, and most importantly, any of the debt that they have. Um, again, the fact that the county has no real ability to weigh in about whether or not that makes sense um, or not um, kind of is, is a little jarring um, for us. There's also, you know, the ability um, or the lack of the ability for a county to plan. Uh, this sets some very definitive timelines for when that township must be dissolved. Um, I believe it's within 90 days of the resolution being passed. Well, that's not an awful lot of time for a county to start budgeting um, for one or more townships being dissolved. And so for those reasons, you know, we had some real concerns with this. Um, right now, this only applies to, to McHenry County. Um, when this bill was moving through uh, the process, you know, there were several um, county board members from McHenry County who were, were uh, vocal in their displeasure that the sponsor of the bill had not sat down and, and actually talked with the county board members about whether or not this made sense for them. And so that kind of caused um, some consternation uh, and again, raised some red flags for, for us at the association level. I think it's always been our position that consolidation when it works is done at the local level and it's done when local communities are talking to one another to make sure that it's actually viable, um, will reduce property taxes and make sense um, financially for the absorbing body. Um, if it's gonna create a burden for the absorbing body and, and potentially increase property taxes uh, or at least the financial burden, um, then there needs to be some more consideration given to it. So. Um, like I said, right now, this bill only applies to McHenry County, but I have talked to several uh, General Assembly members who uh, have an inkling that they, they'd like to see this expanded, um, you know, either to Cook County or Lake County or, or some of the other collar counties that have been the ones that um, I've really heard some interest um, being talked about right now. So, yeah, again, just with... And a good point to make too, Taylor, is that, you know, uh, I think it was either three or four years ago, our association took the lead and we helped put together a piece of legislation. We worked with um, some of the lawmakers looking to, you know, to to move forward on consolidation. We worked with the township officials and others. And, and you have that authority now. The counties have that authority, but it's at your discretion to work with your townships if you so choose to move in that direction. And again, Taylor alluded to that. We'd like to see this, if any consolidation takes place, it's done on the local level and it's done, you know, for the benefit of your citizens. Uh, it gives each of you that discretion to do what is best interest of your communities, your local governments. You have that authority. What we don't want to see is to see something like this mandated and expanded to counties who at this point in time, if they were to eliminate their townships, the road districts in particular moving over to the county could be a substantial uh, obligation on the county. And you know, we do have a state that is very diverse. 
with respect to local roads and and the mileage and things like that. So, you know, again, you have the authority. If if you guys want to consolidate, it's there. But we like to have the permissiveness that that is for each area of the state and each county and those localities to decide on their own. Um, you know, again, this bill we're going to be we expect more. We expect more of this. This was supposed to be a test run. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be a test run that comes to fruition before we see other legislation. Uh, we've had that promise before and it didn't take place. So we expect, you know, to see other um, pieces of legislation trailer this. Correct, Taylor? Yes, yes, yes we do. Uh, and again, as the bill that we previously worked on on prior General Assembly that's now law, um, it gives you options, and I really think it gives options to the county board and to the, to the localities within the county to come up with different ways uh, to consolidate. It might make sense if there's three townships um, to combine two of them and the county absorb, you know, the responsibilities of one of the townships. Um, it gives flexibility. This one, uh, House Bill 348, doesn't really have any flexibility within it, it just simply punts all the responsibilities uh, to the county. And again, with no way in it. So um, we, we are fearful that, that this is, is gonna spread, even though there's already mechanisms out there that operate much better uh, to allow for consolidation. Uh, we'll move to House Bill 834. Um, and again, we, we talked about uh, making sure changes uh, are being done as far as your regulations and what you do in the hiring process. This bill bans uh, employers and employment agencies from asking applications, past wage and compensation histories, um, <clears throat> and then using any such information to screen candidates for a job. This took place in September um, 29th of last year. Um, so if you haven't made that change yet, please do so. Uh, you need to update your hiring policies to make sure you're in um, compliance with many of these new laws, uh, but obviously particularly this one as well. Um, there is a stiff uh, penalty for violating this new provision of uh, up to $10,000. Um, and so, you know, this, this, is, uh, this could be costly. So again, please uh, review and update your hiring policies uh, to make sure that employment applications don't ask for information like this. Uh, interview during the interview process, um, you're not asking um, questions that relate specifically to this. Um, this new law took effect in, in late last year, and and you know we need to we need to make sure we're complying with it. Uh, we'll move to, um, you know, what, as Kelly mentioned, uh, the governor got several of his, excuse me, all of his high profile, but he had several um, initiatives through. Um, these three all deal with cannabis. Um, you know, I mean, we could spend probably an hour talking about the new cannabis law in and of itself, but just going over the highlights, um, you know, obviously it's legal now. Um, it has to be for adults 21 years and older. Um, I think a lot of people forget that and they, they're so used to, you know, how cigarettes used to be sold. It's 21 or over. Um, I know several local governments have opted out. I think a key um, thing to keep in mind is that's an annual basis. So if you change uh, and have a different opinion um, you know, in two years or, or next year or three years, um, you know, you're going to be able to do that. Um, it also allowed for reasonable zoning restrictions um, to be placed and related to licensing of, of businesses. Now, there's a, a trailer bill in veto session that um, clarified and made clear uh, an employer's right to drug test. So, as employers, at the local level, you can still have a zero policy um, place, uh, uh, excuse me, a zero uh, tolerance policy in place to prohibit your employees 
um, from utilizing drugs, including cannabis. Uh, this does not impede your ability or an employer's ability to do that if they so desire. And um, you obviously can still have uh, drug tests and consequences for those who fail drug tests. Um, it, the initial cannabis bill just didn't quite clarify that enough. And so that's what the trailer bill did. Um, also, there was a, a medical cannabis program um, bill excuse me, that expands and made permanent uh, the medical cannabis program. Um, also, every county now, instead of just Cook County, has the ability to establish a 3% tax uh, on med medical cannabis. They also expanded the, um, the number of illnesses that cannabis could be um, prescribed for. Um, I think it went up to 21 yeah, oh, is that right? The, the list is now 20. There's 21 different items that, yeah. that qualify now. They added about 11 new conditions to that. Yeah. 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 And, and um, you know, for those on the phone and, and uh, joining us in some of our other counties, we know we've sent you quite a bit of information on this. We held a seminar last year to cover the basics and get you guys up to speed uh, so you could get started on this. If you go to our website, and I'll, you know, uh, allude to the addresses later on one of the slides, on our homepage, we do have a cannabis button. And if you go to that, you'll see some informational materials. We do have a drug-free workplace uh, policy that we put together. We sent it out to all of our member counties to include language that addresses the new cannabis law. So you're welcome to use that language. We think it's important to make sure your, your policies are updated so that you can continue to adhere to the, the no drug policies for your counties. We think it's good to do that. Also, with respect to this law, we've got counties and cities moving forward in various stages of this. Um, you can adopt your ordinance on an annual basis. You can rescind it as well. But again, it wasn't anything you had to do immediately. We've seen counties go in various directions. So also on our website, we're not putting up everyone's ordinance, but we do have three different or four different sample ordinances on there for you for, for language with counties that have adopted um, both the, uh, the county tax and, and the municipal tax. We've had some that did half. They've opted out of one and taken the other. And then there's language of ones that have opted out entirely. So you've got some samples on our website if you need to look at that for those counties that have yet to take action. Um, if there are any other resources you need, just call us and hopefully we can provide them to you. But again, uh, as Taylor mentioned, we can go on forever on this one. But we will be having probably some follow-up education and we do anticipate probably some more trailer bills as this new <laughs> this new law plays out in the state of Illinois. Yes. Right here in Springfield, they're already looking at a downtown um, cafe type for usage of the uh, of the marijuana. So we're probably going to see some different zoning regulations there. We don't believe those are going to be in the unincorporated areas of the county. But again, you never know what's going to transpire. So we do imagine probably, and Taylor, correct me if I'm wrong, some probably some future trailer legislation. And hopefully that will enhance the law enforcement side of us, uh, of our counties as well, because there is still strong concerns on the law enforcement side of this. Yeah. Kelly's right. Um, I don't know if we'll see anything pass this year. I think um, the governor and others want to want to kind of let the the new program settle in a bit. But I do know um, that there's people keeping a very close eye on this, and like all massive pieces of legislation, certainly of this size, um, there's going to need to be tweaks and corrections, um, you know, in for the years to come, certainly. Um, <clears throat> House Bill 2988 deals with wind farm zoning. Um, Kelly and I spent a lot of time uh, this year working with all the different stakeholders on this. Um, again, this was important because, <clears throat> um, well, I, I should say this was um, this was a bill brought forward by a specific uh, because of specific um, wind developer and a specific uh, township in Douglas County. Um, this 
in their words, clarified that counties and municipalities have the sole authority for establishing uh, standards to develop wind farms in the state. Uh, there are counties, or there, there's a statute on the books that say that in counties that do not have zoning, uh, a township, if they go through the necessary process, can establish um, some very limited zoning standards. And two townships in Douglas County, who does not have zoning, did that um, to prohibit a very large uh, wind turbine from going up in the township. It was voted on by uh, the citizens of the township and passed by the board. And so this bill basically went in and um, basically undid the work that the township did and, and the constituents uh, of that township. And so this was kind of worrying for us because what we're seeing is a company didn't like the statute and decided to go in and change how the law worked to benefit them. So that we, you know, we watched this very closely because if it could happen, you know, for this one instance, certainly the possibility that it could happen uh, either by another developer or in another industry um, could happen for, for us as well. And so, um, although it did, you know, I don't know if it strengthened our, our, our ability, um, it just removed the ability for um, townships and unzoned counties or counties that don't have zoning. zoning. So um, again, special legislation like this can be worrisome uh, and it's something that Kelly and I do watch out for. Um, the next bill is House Bill 3687. This requires state's attorneys to notify a school district when an employee is arrested for a sexual offense. Um, we want to make sure that that, you know, that needs to be understood and conveyed to the state's attorney's office. Um, they have to notify a school district when an employee is arrested for, for a sex offense now. Um, the next bill is House Bill 3711. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this requires all public buildings, retail stores, and restaurants to have diaper changing, excuse me, diaper changing facilities and restrooms for both men and women. Uh, there are exceptions uh, in certain cases for small businesses, uh, as well as in buildings where the installation of changing stations will interfere uh, with access for people with disabilities. Um, and there's a broad exemption for industrial buildings and bars. But um, again, we talked a little bit earlier about how national discourse can manifest itself into, into um, state law. This, this is kind of one of those. This is part of that broader national conversation. Um, I think an interesting note or note we should all be aware of is that signage outside of the entrance to the restrooms where the station is located would also be required. So not only do you need to uh, install the diaper changing station, um, you also need to make note of it uh, in your signage. So, um, you know, again, please, please comply with, with some of these changes um, as they are now state law. That was it for our um, kind of breakdown of bills that passed. Um, just real quick, as I mentioned earlier, the the spring session for 2020, this is the second year of the 101st General Assembly, will not begin until January 28th. Um, January 29th is the governor's state of the state address, where the governor you know, kind of talks just about, uh, lays out his vision um, for the state's future and kind of the accomplishments of the past year. February 19th is a, is a date you probably want to circle because that's the governor's budget address where the governor will lay out the roadmap financially um, for the next fiscal year. Um, we'll, he'll also talk about, uh, we'll get to see um, the, the projected revenue the state is anticipating on bringing in and, and whether or not uh, things like cannabis have had the positive impact on the budget um, that we all assumed and budgeted for. There is concern that there's gonna be a slight um, budget gap again. Uh, and so we'll have to see 
Um, last year, we were helped by uh, some of the tax returns at the federal level, um, which helped close the budget gap. We're not anticipating that to be the case. That was kind of a one-year uh, thing, and so there could be a potential budget gap. I've heard of somewhere around $1.5 to $2.5 billion budget gap, um, but the governor's budget address will outline their anticipation of that. March 17th is the primary election. Um, you know, that's a big day. Uh, and then May 31st is where we're uh, anticipating adjournment for this spring session to end. Last year, because of the budget and some of the other big bills, they went two days over. Um, hopefully that's not the case uh, this year. And with that, Kelly, I don't know if you had anything to wrap up with or if we were turning over to questions. No, I'm fine. We can turn it over to questions. Did you, because we're out of time, we'll, we'll hold off on um, talking about any of the initiatives moving forward this year that are on our agenda. And if they have any questions on those, they can call me. Could you, um, Kelly, can you post uh, to this or go to the slide that shows your contact information? Yeah, Taylor, you want to just fast forward. Um, on, our, um, on our website, I mentioned we have a lot of resources. We just did the new laws summary for 2020, which includes these bills along with many others that impact various departments of local government. So it's much broader than what we uh, presented to you today. Those were the primary ones. So if you go on our website right now, you'll see out on the legislative page, a new laws summary. You can tap on that. It's about a 16 page report and it will give you a summary of all of the new public acts that we feel are of importance for local governments and the various departments. Throughout the year, as you know, if you're member counties, you receive our counties at the Capitol. We send that out very frequently and that kind of keeps you updated on the new laws. We don't do a weekly. Um, a lot of people have said those are kind of burdensome to keep looking on emails and seeing daily things and I don't disagree with them. So anytime you have questions, just give us a call, but we keep you updated via these reports and give you kind of the background of what's happening, some of the things you won't see necessarily in your local newspaper. A lot of times the local government issues are not making headlines in the local newspaper. So again, those are things we want to uh, make sure you're aware of. There's our contact information for myself and Taylor. Um, again, if you go to our website, just check around there. There's some resources for you. And again, on the cannabis and some of the employment laws, you're welcome to use them. If there's anything we didn't answer today, you have questions on after the meeting, please email me or give me a call and we'll get them addressed. And uh, again, we appreciate your participation today and we thank you for your membership and continued support in working on these legislative issues with us. It's very important for county governments to stay involved because many of the things that the General Assembly deals with impact, impact you and uh, it's important that you guys stay uh, abreast of these and we appreciate the opportunity to work with you.